as far as I'm concerned, I don't think there's anybody literally in the country uh, that's better versed or ready to talk to us about green and where it's going uh, today. So uh, please uh, put your hands together and give a warm link welcome to Ms. Christine Irvin. That a warm, warm welcome. You've made me so feel so much at home. I think two other factors have contributed to this emergence of green buildings so quickly, um, and in an in an industry that is traditionally very slow to change. One was the LEED green building rating system. How many of you are familiar with it? Quite, a, I'd say about a third of you, maybe. And I'll spend a few minutes on it later. Um, but it is the most powerful market transformation tool I've seen for bringing all this together in a very market savvy way that uh, people could rally around. And the second was leaders, personal and private sector leaders. When we launched LEAD uh, in spring of 2000, the administrator for the GSA uh, stood up, world's largest property manager, he came from Silicon Valley, and he said, all new GSA buildings over a certain square footage are going to be lead, not just certified, but the next layer up, silver. You can imagine the ripple of confidence that that sent through the marketplace and the almost instant credibility that we had. But there are leaders in the private sector as well that stood out early, like Heinz Real Estate Development, Johnson Control uh, in the uh, energy space, uh, Herman Miller. That built the critical mass of confidence that we needed. But enough talking, let's, let's look at a few of these buildings to give you a sense of the excitement underway. Uh, Sidwell Friends Middle School, top level lead platinum, 61% less electricity used. Uh, the Oregon Health Sciences Medical Complex in Portland, Oregon, 400,000 square feet. You know that these kinds of complexes uh, use about twice as much energy and water as a typical building. Well, in this case, the developer and the owner said, uh, we want a building that's 60% less than Oregon Code, which is one of the strongest in the country. And they use that as a basis for doing the RFP to select the engineering firm. So that gives you a taste of some of the exciting things going on. But you've probably noticed that a lot of these are new buildings, right? And in ways that that's not surprising because um, it's easier to build a whole portfolio of sustainability when you're starting from scratch. And that's one reason why we started LEED in the new commercial space. Smaller market, easier to work with, uh, to get a toehold there. Um, but this sinking economy is changing the dynamics, as you well know. And so what we're finding, and what you're finding, is more and more owners are looking for ways to upgrade and make their facilities more competitive, more desirable, and to compete with the new high-performance grade buildings that are already built. And uh, we're seeing that mirrored in the lead activity as well. Of the 2,200 projects that are registered or certified for lead existing buildings and operations, two-thirds of them came in last year alone. So it's a big trend. And uh, I'm glad it's happening because I'm, even in Portland just recently, a major leading tenant for a 15-story building had been there for many years, just moved out to a new green building because they did the calculus and found it'd be much easier to do that than to renovate their space. So a lot of owners are looking for ways to become more efficient, to cut their operating costs, and to renovate green in a way so that they can compete with some other properties out there. And I hope I've given you a good feel for how this all emerged. Uh, the timing, uh, market tools like Energy Star and LEED and leadership. But you know, I don't think that we'd be seeing this phenomenal growth and this mainstream growth if it weren't for something else that's just vital. And it's something that you, I've heard you talking about already, and it's the value added, this diverse array of different values uh, that your clients are looking for. Well, I am so happy to be celebrating with you tonight. What a fantastic legislative session. It makes me so proud to be an Oregonian, I can't tell you. So congratulations, Jonathan, OLCV, all the supporters here, and of course our elected officials for making that happen. Tonight, 
Tonight I am going to be talking about, surprise, surprise, the vibrant green building market. I need to tell you, I'm, and you probably realize this, I am a techno enthusiast. I've been working in this area for quite some time. In fact, I remember the day that I discovered the power of green technologies to capture the imagination of the media and the public. So here we have a snow day. All of federal government is shut down on the day of our solar press conference. A number of us come into work anyway, and we trudge down to the basement of the Forestall building, open the door, and there is a room full of eager reporters. We had a rousing press conference. An AP story ran with a photograph, ran in hundreds of newspapers uh, over the next week or so. I was told it was the single most successful press conference in DOE history. And by successful, I mean positive press. <laughs> a fact appreciated in this crowd. And then a year later, we had an equal success, this time with new lighting technology that we were demonstrating at the Air and Space Museum. And I'll never forget an Australian engineer coming up to me saying, you Americans are so clever. <laughs> well, yes, we are. And we can do anything we put our minds to when we have leaders that capture the imagination and the will of the public, which is what Oregon has. But there is another side of technology that is often overlooked, underfunded, or just not understood. And it's what I call the soft side of technology. And by that I mean private market signals, like energy prices, carbon prices, there's a concept, that can make all the difference between a laboratory curiosity and something that really transforms the market. Or maybe it's the predictability of those signals. Classic example, the renewable energy tax credits. I remember when Jeffrey Immelt, the CEO for GE, told Congress so clearly two years ago, nothing chills private investment in these technologies more than uncertainty over whether or not these tax credits are going to continue. Another example of self-technology is um, syncing the technology with how humans behave. I mean, think of how long we endured the VCR remote until TiVo technologies came along. Well, you know, in the climate change arena, think how much we've learned about the effective communication of climate change just in the last two years. And then consider that less than one half of 1% of the entire federal climate change budget is devoted to the behavioral sciences. It's not a coincidence. So in fact, public policy, the work of many, many, many people here tonight, plays a huge role in shaping the rules of the road for the private market that has a huge bearing on technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Concordia, for putting together this incredible symposium. So tell me, are you feeling powerful now? Okay. <laughs> you know, it was Sir Francis Bacon, one of the architects of the science revolution more than 500 years ago, that coined that popular phrase, knowledge is power. And after this bounty of knowledge that we've been fed over the last day and a half, uh, we should be feeling very powerful indeed. Now, Sir Bacon added another thought that doesn't get quite as uh, many quotations. And it goes something like this. The great end of life is not knowledge, but action. Which reminds me of a byline that I saw on Concordia's website. Students at Concordia are inspired to change and be changed by the world. So that's the challenge for all of us right now, isn't it? How do we take this bounty of knowledge and turn ourselves into agents of change? You know, one reason why I was so pleased to join you is because of the role that colleges and universities play. You know, you, you do everything here. Your real estate developers and building operators, you manage transportation fleets and utilities. Um, the public respects you as virtually no other group in the country, which is important. You have students. You build the knowledge that we need for transitioning to this new economy. And then you have the most potent weapon of all, 
I like what uh, Michael Crow, president of Arizona State, said when he said, well, you know, universities, and compared to major other sectors, may not contribute that much greenhouse gas emissions. And he said, yes, but we have 100% of the students. And so we move into the public realm. William Proxmire, uh, I'm told, the senator from years ago said, well, everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. So I will be seconding a, a number of things that you've heard before. But I really cannot urge you enough to communicate your issues and concerns to your local officials, state officials, federal officials. They need to hear this. They often do hear from those that don't want change. They don't hear enough from people that do want change. And that includes small businesses as well uh, that need to be working with their elected officials. Tell them that you do support stronger building codes quickly, higher efficiency standards, higher cafe standards. Believe me, they don't hear that enough. And not only because they are the fastest, cheapest way to do this, but because they are part of the market system. You know, voluntary programs like Energy Star and LEED are designed to reward the top 25% of best practices, to get them out there and to get experience in the marketplace. But after they've been proven, it really is up to government to start, and industry associations to start building that into codes and standards. That's the secret behind California's success. They have held their per capita electricity uh, rates constant for 25 years because of systematic upgrades at every opportunity for their codes and their standards, while the rest of the country has gone up a percent and a half every year. You know, I think all of this is particularly important, too, in harnessing the market, because if you've noticed, we really don't use the market that we've got, that we're so proud of. Microeconomics 101. Perfect prices and information are the key to making a market function well. But we tend to penalize the things that we want more of, like those production tax credits, and we subsidize what we need less of, which always reminds me of free market and economist jokes. I'm married to an economist. I, I feel this is OK. <laughs> How many economists does it take to change a light bulb? None. If it needed changing, the market would change it. <laughs> or how many economists does it take to change a light bulb? If government would get out of the way, it would screw itself in. <laughs> the dirty little secret is that government regulation is part of a well-functioning market. And without it, we see what's happening on Wall Street. Well, many have likened this adventure that we're on to the Apollo mission. It's much bigger than that. It is Apollo and the New Deal and the Manhattan Project. It is not a trivial undertaking. But it is definitely the spirit of the Apollo mission that John F. Kennedy captured so well and understood at Rice University in 1962. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energy and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. Can you think of anything more satisfying and more urgently needed for us to usher in this new sustainable economy? It's up to us to create the political will to make it happen now. Thank you.